Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. My name is Tasneem Koka, and I am delighted to be today's presenter in this, our second in our series of webinars on talent analytics and the role of talent analytics in business development. Today's subject is how to be a team player. So we'll talk a little bit about how lawyers can collaborate successfully for greater success in business development. And again, thank you for joining us. As we set our objectives for today's session, um, they are fourfold. Number one, I'll spend a little bit of time refreshing on some of the talent analytics and role profiles information that we covered in our first webinar. For those of you who were able to join us, I hope that this will be a valuable refresher of that information. And for those who weren't able to join us, I hope that this will give you a, a valuable foundation for the rest of our conversation. Secondly, then, we'll talk about the opportunity that, that collaboration presents. The, the benefits of promoting teaming and collaboration in our sales efforts. Third, we'll talk about some of the very common myths about promoting collaboration. And lastly, we'll talk about some alternative approaches to how, in how to foster teaming and collaboration to create greater success in business development. So with those four objectives, let's dive in. As I mentioned, I wanted to start with a little bit of uh, background on talent analytics. And again, this may be a refresher for those of you who were able to join us for our first webinar. Number one, what are talent analytics? When we think about talent analytics, we define it as simply using data and analysis to inform decisions and shed light on questions about people. And we have found certainly um, that over the, over the years, using this kind of data and information can be incredibly valuable as we think about our talent strategies and how to make the most of our people and their capabilities in order to foster success both for individuals and for our organization. Now, when it comes to growth place talent analytics, like many other organizations, we have a proprietary talent analytics tool and assessment. Um, many of you are familiar with other assessments like Myers-Briggs or uh, Strengths Finders. Growth Play's talent analytics and assessment tool is similar, um, but different in some marked ways. Um, the survey is 288 questions um, that any single participant in the survey completes. When they complete those 288 questions, we collect 866 points of data. Wow, that's a lot of data on any single participant. And in particular, we are measuring those participants against 140 or more validated competencies. And in the case of Growth Place Talent Analytics, all of those competencies are specifically geared towards sales, business development, client service, and customer experience, so client-facing roles that our survey in particular measures. The history of our survey is that we were started, the survey was developed initially out of a grant from the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, that department was looking for a tool to, uh, to measure how to, how to uh, find candidates for law enforcement positions that would be a good fit for those positions. And so that's where our survey got its start. However, we quickly pivoted to sales, business development, and client-facing competencies. And over the past 40 years, we've collected data in that area with over 750,000 individuals who we have assessed. Our our assessment in particular measures a few things. Number one, it me measures capacity versus performance. So whereas we think of performance as being someone's actual output, what they are doing and what they are achieving at any given moment in time, we think of capacity as their ability or capability to perform, um, which is measured uh, not necessarily with respect to any given point of time, but is more uh, predictive of them. 
And that brings me to the second idea, which is our survey is uh, predictive rather than descriptive in nature. So for those of you who have familiarity with a Myers-Briggs or a StrengthsFinder or others of those assessments, you know that they describe you, they tell you about who you are and how you're wired and what some of your natural tendencies and preferences are. Our survey instead is predictive. It points to the capacity that one has to perform, and it is predictive in nature, meaning that it tells us that, in fact, this person has the ability to perform and can perform given the right tools and circumstances. And lastly, then, our survey uh, represents its results in percentile scores. So uh, when, a, when a participant gets an 88, um, a score of 88 on any one of those 140 competencies, that means that that individual is stronger in that competency than 88% of the other participants against which they're being compared. Lastly, of course, we know that any talent analytics tool is just one piece of the puzzle that informs our talent decisions and our strategies. So we are by no means saying that talent analytics are a panacea um, and tell us everything that we need to know about how we measure and manage our people, but rather we recognize talent analytics as one very powerful tool in the entire set of tools from evaluations to onboarding, to training and development, to job tools that we can use to help our talent be at their best. So with that talent analytics profile, with our proprietary talent, talent analytics platform, Growth Play has developed six business development roles that are specifically geared towards doer sellers. Um, and I'll review those roles now. The first of those six roles is the new business developer. Um, this is sometimes classically known as a hunter role. Um, this uh, role is what we would think of as a quintessential networker, and people who identify with this role are focused on lead generation. Sometimes we think of these folks as our quintessential backslappers, glad handers, our extroverts, um, the life of the party or the social butterfly that is extremely capable at meeting new individuals and filling the top of our sales funnel. Again, that classic hunter. Our second in the six roles is the client relationship developer, which for those of you who are familiar with the hunter-farmer dynamic, this is the farmer role. So uh, this role is what we think of as an account manager, and individuals who fit this role tend to be focused on growing and guarding existing client relationships. Very good at um, maintaining those relationships and growing those relationships over time. Again, the farmer type role. A third role is the cross-seller role. And we think of this role as the quintessential dot connector. Cross-sellers are extremely good at offering new services to existing clients. So they take the full scope of services that our firms or organizations have to offer, and they think about how those services connect with, can connect with the firm's existing clients. Number four then is the new service developer, and this role is an innovator role. This role is particularly geared towards focusing, um, towards developing new offerings for new or existing markets. So this role is thinking about how is it that we innovate how we go to market and the offerings and services with which we go to market in a way that allows us to further tap our existing markets or to tap into new markets. The fifth role is the subject matter expert. Um, I like to call this one the big brain. Uh, this is the role uh, that we think of as the quintessential technical expert, the person who is extremely good at the services or the work that we do. 
And one of the things that we think is interesting is that, of course, traditionally, this subject matter expert role is sometimes overlooked in the context of business development. We don't always think of a technical expert as having a valuable role to play in business development. And yet we take a contrary view to that. We have seen that subject matter experts, in fact, can be very, very valuable in the business development process, particularly when it comes to things like thought leadership and sharing insights with existing and potential clients in ways that familiarize them with our capabilities and promote the selling process. And then last but not least, the sixth role is the player coach role. And this role is a mentorship role, one who is not only focused on their own, uh, their own contribution or success in business de development, but rather is focused on promoting the success of others. So let's take a look at what the data shows us about these roles. Um, as we look at the full set of doer-seller data within our Growth Play Talent Analytics uh, database, we've, come to, we've found some interesting things in the data. Number one is that 98% of doer-sellers match at least one profile. This is great news. We know that almost every single doer seller that we have had participate in our growth play assessment has a role to play in business development. And for those of us who are charged with promoting the success of our lawyers and other professionals in business development, this is fantastic news for us. An interesting uh, corollary to that point of data is that only 16% align with all of all of the profiles. And this one is really interesting, right? Because when you think about the combination of these two, what it tells us is that while everyone has a role to play in business development, very, very few are good at playing every single role. And so when we ask our lawyers and other professionals to do everything, when we ask them to be great networkers and great account managers and great technical experts and great innovators, we're simply asking them to do more than they have the capacity to do. And that's where teaming and collaboration really comes into play. A few other things we've seen in the data. Number one is that 88% match the client relationship developer profile. This is by, high, by far the highest match um, in our database. So, um, and for those of you who have been at this for a while, I suspect that this is no surprise, right? We see day in and day out how so many of our lawyers and other professionals are extremely good at guarding and growing existing client relationships. And this is excellent news for our revenue. A second thing that we've seen, though, is that uh, as opposed to the farmer role that has 88% of matches, um, new business developer, that hunter role, is the one that has the fewest aligned to it. Still 34%, so still a healthy, uh, more than a third of our doer-seller database, but a, 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 a smaller proportion than the other role. Now, the other thing that we look at is not only uh, where uh, individuals match, but what their best match is. So this is the difference between someone who might be a match for multiple roles, like client relationship developer, um, but also might be a match for subject matter expert or, um, or cross-seller. And when we look at their best match, what's their strongest match, what we see is that over half of the database is best aligned with that, again, with that client relationship developer profile. And on the other side of the spectrum, the least frequent best match is cross-seller. Only 4% of our database matched best with the cross-seller profile. And this we found to be a particularly interesting uh, piece of data as well, particularly when we think about how many of our organizations struggle mightily with cross-selling. And of course, that's a big part of why we wanted to have the conversation that we're having with you all today. So let's think for a moment about why collaboration matters. What's, what's in it for us? Why should we care about fostering teaming and collaboration in our organization? 
Well, the bottom line is that when we foster teaming and collaboration, we make more money. <laughs> and which one of us doesn't want that? Which one of us doesn't have at least one of our metrics for success in our organization, uh, the generation of revenue? In fact, as marketing, business development uh, professionals, as those of us who are focused on promoting the success of our lawyers and other professionals in our organization in selling, revenue is of course one of the primary metrics by, we, what, by which we measure our success. And what the data shows us is a fewfold. Number one, this bears out in the longevity of our client relationship. So the data shows that when clients are served by only one relationship manager, a single lawyer who owns that relationship, that when, if and when that single lawyer retires or otherwise departs our organization, that that client relationship is highly likely to face attrition, that that client is very unlikely, in fact, to stay with us. Whereas, when those client relationships are managed or served by multiple relationship uh, managers within the organization, those clients are far less likely to leave our, client, our organization when any single relationship manager departs the firm. So it just, it simply points to the greater longevity of client relationships that are, uh, that have stickiness with multiple um, sellers and managers within our organization's relationship managers. The other thing that the data shows us is that client relationships that are served by multiple individuals in multiple areas of service, offering, or practice are over time have a, have a much higher lifetime value of the relationship. And so those client relationships tend to, number one, in the end, be more profitable, and number two, in the end, generate more revenue over the lifetime of the client relationship. And so at the end of the day, what this tells us is that it's worth it, right? It is worth us spending time figuring out how to crack this nut. All right. So let's think about a little bit more of the context of this. And one of the things that we always think about in terms of the context of teaming and collaboration, particularly for lawyers and other professional services providers, is the idea that they are doer sellers. They have the um, dual role of number one, doing the work, um, providing legal services, as well as selling the work, um, as opposed to traditional salespeople whose primary and maybe only role is to sell. So what's attendant with that doer seller dilemma? Number one is that lawyers and other professionals aren't necessarily known for their innate sales skills, right? They did not choose their profession because selling was a part of it. Now, certainly, some of our lawyers think of their role as selling their client's cause to a jury or a judge, um, or selling our, their client's position to a counterparty in a negotiation. But when it comes to selling their, themselves or selling their services, um, that is not necessarily the most comfortable place for many of our lawyers and other professionals. Second is, of course, the dual, dual challenge of doing and selling, which is this idea that our lawyers and other professionals have to have the dual uh, demands on their time of, and energy of billing hours or providing services to clients as well as selling. And it, it sets up an inherent challenge to where they put their time and energy because their time and energy is split between the two responsibilities. A third idea is, this, is, of course, that success in business development is in part simply uh, determined by how much time you invest in it. So when you have doer sellers, lawyers, who have to both bill hours and invest time in business development, because they have that, that split in their focus, they're going to naturally spend less time at business development than someone who has a singular focus on business development. And so because success is in, term, in part determined by how much time you invest, um, doer sellers are, are at a somewhat of a disadvantage. By the same token, we also know that time invested in business development does not produce immediate results. So we know that attending a network or a networking attend, uh, event or a conference 
does not yield a signed engagement letter, that rather our lawyers and other professionals, our doer sellers who are investing in business development activities have to hang in there for a while to see the fruits of our labor, uh, to see the fruits of their labor. And yet it's, that can be difficult when they are challenged in time and can feel a sense of frustration or spinning their wheels when they're investing in business development. Another thing that we see is that lone wolf rainmakers are the, a thing of the past. And so that's really borne out in the data that we've seen with respect to those six role profiles, right? I mentioned earlier that less than 20% of our doer sellers are a good fit for all six of those roles. So it's no, no uh, surprise that when we look around our firm, it's hard for us to find those all arounders, those people who can do everything, who can network, who can manage a client relationship, who can be a technical expert, it just doesn't exist in the same way that maybe it once did. So what that leads us to is this idea that when we can leverage the strengths of individuals, when we can work with our lawyers and other doer sellers to think about the roles at which they are best suited and then create collaborative selling where lawyers who fit complementary roles team and collaborate together, we can far, create far greater strides. So with that context, let's talk a little bit about how to actually make that happen. And I wanted to start that conversation with some business development fundamentals. Those of you who uh, are familiar with growth based growth plays methodology, um, these fundamentals will be familiar to you as well, and yet we find that they are valuable context for any conversation about business development and certainly about teaming and collaboration. So the first is this idea, an underlying principle, that business development is about developing authentic relationships. We know that the legal, the legal industry and so many of our professional services industries are relationship-driven businesses, that people hire lawyers that they know, like, and trust. And so developing authentic relationships must be at the center of our business development efforts. A second idea is that business development is about providing solutions to problems that should be solved. And on the one hand, the good news is that our lawyers and other professionals are used to being problem solvers because in many ways, their professions are to be paid problem solvers, right? Our lawyers, our teams of lawyers, their, their entire mission in their profession is to get their clients from where they are to where they want to be, which makes them paid problem solvers. And yet, in the context of business development, we, went to, we want to get our lawyers and professionals thinking about a far greater breadth of problem solving. So not just solving in the problems that they get paid to solve, but in fact, solving all kinds of problems that they may not necessarily get paid to solve, but that are investments in those authentic relationships that show the people with whom we are building those relationships that we are committed to their personal and professional success that we are committed to the success of their organization and that we are positioning ourselves as go-to resources such that when the problem arises that we can get paid to solve, we're well positioned to be considered for that. So whether that means we're investing those relationships and solving the kinds of problems that look like helping our contacts find a new job or hire someone new to their team or look good in front of their boss or key stakeholders or whatever it might be, helping our, our doer sellers, our lawyers and other professionals who are in that selling role, think about how they approach problem solving in those relationships broadly as a way to position themselves for opportunity to solve problems that they do get paid to solve is a fundamental part of the process. And then lastly, this idea that success in business development is as much determined by how you execute as by what you do tactically. So when I talk about the what of the tactics, I'm talking about writing articles, attending events, giving presentations, taking people out to lunch and dinner, entertaining clients at uh, ball games or entertainment events. All of those things are the tactics. And what we have seen over the decades is that there are 
multiple different formulas for success in terms of tactics. In fact, as many formulas for success as we've seen successful rainmakers, right? Everyone does it slightly differently um, based on their strengths, their preferences, and also things related to the markets that they're trying to tap into. And yet what we have seen time and time again is that all successful rainmakers share many of the same disciplines in terms of how they execute those business development activities. So when it comes to preparation, planning, strategy, when it comes to execution, when it comes to follow up and follow through, when it comes to the core disciplines of keeping their business development activities well planned out, well thought out, well executed, and well followed through on, those disciplines, that sustainability and that rigor in business development is often what we see are the distinctions of successful rainmakers. And so as we go through some of the best practices today, I'll focus on some of those how disciplines, not just the tactics. All right. As we talk about some of the best practices around fostering teaming and collaboration, I built our conversation around this business development process. So when we think about the process of business development as it unfolds over time from beginning to end, it looks something like this. Number one, we identify a target that's a good fit for our firm or our practice, right? We have to find someone who is a good fit client or potential client with whom we can begin. Once we've identified that target, we then move into relationship building. This is the part of the process we, where we are building and nurturing relationships with the kinds of clients and potential clients who can be good fits for our practice and our firm in order to build that likability and trust that, that lays the foundation for doing business together. We then look for a transition or a triggering event in the relationship. We look for some opportunity for our services to be relevant for that client or potential client. In fact, many of our lawyers, when they meet a client or potential client for the first time, that client or potential client has existing service providers and isn't necessarily looking for new lawyers or at law firms or outside counsel to work with. And so we've got to stay in relationship building until we can find a transition or triggering event that creates a need or an opportunity for our services to be relevant. When that happens, then and only then do we move into sales execution, hopefully, and closing the deal. Now, when we work with lawyers, particularly when it comes to team and collaborative selling along this timeline, we often see that they get stuck in a few different places. So one place team and, teaming and collaboration can get stuck is simply by identifying the right targets, right? We often don't know how to identify the best fit clients for whom our teaming and collaborative selling or cross-selling efforts might be a good fit. And so putting some rigor around that can be helpful. And when we talk about some of the best practices for fostering teaming and collaboration in just a moment, I'll talk about the antidote to that problem. A second thing that we often find is that when it comes to our teaming and collaborative selling opportunities, um, lawyers often get stuck in the relationship building space, stuck in what we call the friend zone. Maybe they're successfully able to introduce new uh, lawyers or professionals to clients, but getting over the hump of having someone like them to actually doing business together can be, uh, can be a hurdle. And so thinking about having the right kinds of conversations and interactions that move us from relationship building to transition can be very, very important. And again, when we talk about some of the, um, some of the best practices for fostering teaming and collaboration in just a moment, I'll talk about some of the ways to go from relationship building to transition. And then lastly, one of the ways that we see lawyers uh, get get caught up along this timeline, particularly when it comes to teaming and collaborative selling, is when they go immediately from target to sales execution and try to close without investing in relationship building or looking for a transition or triggering event. And we call this one rushing rejection, folks. 
Um, this is like asking, uh, asking someone to marry you on the first date. We see lawyers or other professionals identify a client where they think teaming or collaborative selling might be a good idea, and they immediately go to, let's set up the pitch meeting. And of course, we get to a pitch meeting like that. Our lawyers go in guns a blazing, uh, ready to tell the client how they should switch from their incumbent counsel in litigation or corporate or employment and move that work to our fabulous colleague to the right. And we get to an end of the meeting, we get to the end of a meeting like that, and the client says to us, Thanks, we'll keep you in mind, which is of course code for goodbye. <laughs> and that is not what we want to hear. And But the reason that that happens is twofold. Number one, we haven't invested in that authentic relationship. We haven't laid that foundation of rapport and trust that it takes to do business together. And number two, we haven't identified a transition or triggering event that actually creates a legitimate need or opportunity for our services to be relevant. Let's remember that most of our clients have incumbent counsel. Their legal needs are being met. They may but not be being met entirely. They may not be being met as well as we think we can meet them, but they're typically, we don't meet a lot of clients that say, gosh darn it, I have this gigantic litigation budget burning a hole in my pocket if only I could find a smart litigator to spend it with, right? That's just not the reality, particularly the, of the current market where we have seen flat demand for almost a decade now with maybe very sluggish, slow, sluggish uh, growth in the last year or two is what we see in the most recent reports. So thinking about how we help our lawyers when they're doing teaming and collaborative selling, um, avoid rushing reje rejection, avoid moving straight from target to sales execution, and really hone in on that relationship building and transition part of it will be a focus of the rest of our conversation. So we're gonna focus on that first half of the time timeline and let's dive in. I styled this part of the conversation um, around a handful of common myths that we hear about teaming and collaboration and selling and some of some alternative approaches to those myths. So the first myth is this idea that we hear time and time again, if lawyers from different practice groups just would tell each other what they do for clients, they would be able to team and sell more collaboratively, right? We would see more cross-selling happening. And the truth of this is that on the one hand, that exchange of information is absolutely necessary for collaborative selling. It's just sadly not sufficient. So here's the thing. We, at those of you who are investing in efforts to help lawyers share with each other the kinds of problems that they're solving for clients and the kinds of clients that they're serving across practices, you are spending your time well. We have to do that. That's foundational. It's necessary for collaborative selling to happen. You can't sell what you don't know. And so educating across practice groups, across industry groups, across teams, lawyers, about other services and other offerings within the firm is absolutely necessary. The problem is it's not sufficient, right? We can do that and we still won't necessarily see teaming and collaborative uh, selling happen. And part of that is because of the centrality of like likability and trust. Because here's the thing, we know that a truth of uh, teaming and collaborative selling is that lawyers who like and trust each other will be most successful at collaborative selling. And this of course makes sense when we think about it, right? Think about the things that are at stake when it comes to teaming and collaboration when it, in business development. It raises issues of compensation. It raises issues of credit. It raises issues of territory. It raises egos. Um, and those are difficult, nettlesome issues particularly if there isn't a foundation of likability and trust between the lawyers who are trying to team and collaborate. And so when we work with our clients, one of the very first things that we get them thinking about is how is it that they can build those relationships of likability and trust within their organization. 
I want to talk about some of the dynamics that are at play here. One of the dynamics that, that are, is at play is the buyer-seller paradox. And this is the idea that when it comes to buying and selling, there are two dynamics at play. There's the emotional dynamic at play, and then there's the rational dynamic in play. And we know that when buyers buy, they tend to buy emotionally and then justify their purchase rationally. So let's listen, think about this in the context of buying legal services. When I talk to buyers of legal services, when I talk to in-house counsel and executives who hire lawyers and law firms, what they tell me is that they hire the lawyers that they like, that they trust, that they want those lawyers to be a part of their team. That absolutely, it's important for those lawyers to be capable. It's important to them that they have the right experience and track record and education and all of those things, that they be experts in the field. The problem is, for any given opportunity, there are probably several lawyers or law firms that are capable of doing the work, right? Many of the clients that we're chasing, they have multiple options of lawyers and firms who can do the work well in terms of technical capabilities. And so ultimately, the thing that tends to differentiate us is do we have that relationship of likability and trust that gets clients comfortable with hiring us. The bad news is, of course, that when we're selling, we tend to sell the opposite way. We tend to sell rationally. We tend to tell clients about our success, our track record, our past experience, the clients that we have that are just like them. And then when we hire us, we get emotionally excited about that. Um, but here's the thing, when it comes to teaming and collaboration in particular, if we think about the fact that one of the things that's really important to buyers buying is that emotional ability to trust and like us, then having lawyers who trust and like each other and who show a client, look, we know how to work as a well-oiled team, you can trust us to team collaboratively on your behalf is really, really important. And I've heard this from the other perspective. When I talk to buyers of legal, legal services and they tell me that they get any whiff of the multiple lawyers who are serving them at a firm fighting over credit, fight, fighting over who's going to take the lead, it's a huge turnoff. Because what it says to the client is those lawyers are putting their own interests ahead of the client, and no client wants to hear us. So this buyer-seller paradox, while important with respect to business development generally, is especially important when it comes to teaming and collaboration, because we not only have to win the trust and likability of clients with any single lawyer, but we have to show that our teams of lawyers like and trust each other in a way that the client can trust. And therefore, one of the thing, one of the places we start when we work with lawyers who are looking to create opportunities to sell in teams, to collaborate in teaming, we tell them to first identify their internal team. Who is that collaborative selling team inside of the firm where they can build that relationship of likability and trust? Who is it that they click with? Who is it that they get along with? Um, I understand that, of course, it's important that their services be complementary or that the kinds of clients that they serve be complementary, but I have been amazed time and time again where lawyers who really like each other, click with each other, trust each other, want to team and collaborate, collaborate with each other, find creative ways to go after new markets and new clients in ways that we may never have thought possible because that they have that underlying foundation of rapport and trust with each other. And attendant with that is encouraging our lawyers to invest in those teaming relationships with the same degree of discipline and proactivity that they invest in their external business development relationships, right? If you're gonna team and collaborate with someone, you gotta get to know them. You've gotta build rapport and trust with them. Coffee, lunch, checking in to see how things are going, finding things to work on where you can develop that sense of trust and collaboration. That's really, really important. And for, particularly for those of you who are thinking about how do we promote cross-selling, how do we integrate laterals, 
this idea of building the internal team is really, really important. So this is where we start with teaming collaborative selling, is building that internal team where rapport and trust exists so that then we can think about where we go next. All right, let's think about a second myth when it comes to teaming and collaboration. One of the things that we hear time and time again is that the best way to jumpstart collaborative selling is by getting lawyers to share their best contacts and clients with each other and then introduce other lawyers to them. And this is another one of those that's a little bit like taking someone home to meet your family on the first date, right? It's just a really tough place to start. If what we're looking for is to get lawyers who tend to be, let's face it, independent workers, um, thinking about teaming and collaboration, particularly in an area like business development, where again, issues like compensation and credit are at stake, Simply going straight to, hey, you've got all these great client relationships, why don't you introduce some new lawyers to them? It's just a tough place to start, because let's remember, right, let's have some empathy with our lawyers. For most of our lawyers, the client relationships that they do have are their most prized possessions, right? They worked hard to land those clients and to nurture those client relationships over years. And so to think that that's the place that they're gonna start collaborative selling by just introducing a bunch of new lawyers to those clients is just a tough, tough place to start. So instead, what we recommend is that we start collaborative selling in places like, let's compare target markets, right? Let's think about the overlap of good fit clients and potential clients that exist between our two practices. Let's look at our business development roadmaps and the various marketing and business development activities that we're investing in, including things like thought leadership, writing and speaking, and see if there are places there that are slightly less high stakes that we can begin our collaborative selling. So let's talk about a couple of concrete tools to do that. A first one is really getting lawyers thinking about sharing target markets. We all know, those of us who are marketing and business development professionals, know that every good marketing and business development undertaking starts with the answer to the question, who? Who are we trying to be interesting and attractive to? And so when we think about that through the lens of teaming and collaboration, we also have to get clear on where those target markets overlap. So when we can think about, when we can help the lawyers who are looking to team and collaborate, think about, okay, let's think about institutional clients where you might have overlap. Let's think about industry verticals. Uh, do both of you have an interest or have some traction in serving a particular industry, whether it's healthcare, um, is there some overlap there? Let's think about buyer type overlaps, right? Are you both serving privately held businesses? Or are you both serving CFOs rather than chief legal officers or chief executive officers or general counsels? When we can start to think, help our lawyers think about the overlap in the who of their business development efforts, that can start to give us a place to begin those cross-selling and teaming and collaborative selling efforts. A second tool we can use is the business development roadmap. And this is a tool that we use to help our clients think about the mix of marketing and business development activities that they're investing in and where they might find overlap with others. So up in the top right left corner is prospects and connectors. Those are all of those clients, potential clients, referral sources, relationships that our lawyers tend to be investing in. And yet there are lots of other marketing and business development activities that our lawyers tend to be undertaking. So there's events and organizations. They're attending conferences, networking events. They're participating in industry organizations, um, uh, associations, charitable organizations and getting our lawyers thinking about, is there a comfortable place to start teaming and collaboration there, right? Could you co-present at a conference? Could you attend together a networking event or other event? Could you introduce a colleague of yours to an organization on which you're the uh, for which you're on the board? Those tend to be some lower stakes places to start teaming and collaborative efforts. 
Similarly, I want to point out the bottom right quadrant, which is content and campaigns. So these are all of those thought leadership campaigns, right? It's the writing, it's the speaking, it's the getting smart about what's happening in the legal landscape, in the economic landscape, in the business landscape, in the political landscape that gives us things to talk about, write about, and be interesting to clients with. And this is another place when we can get our lawyers thinking about if you want to start a teaming or collaborative selling process, could you simply co-author an article or a blog post together or a series of blog posts together? Could you simply co-present at a webinar or seminar or CLE presentation that we host at the firm? Is that a good place for our lawyers to build that underlying foundation of teaming and collaboration so that they can move forward into client relationships from there? The other benefit of this is that you're not asking any one lawyer to open up their own Rolodex, but rather you're helping the lawyers think about how they can build something new together that both of them, uh, that, that's a benefit to both of them, right? That's a net new benefit to both of them. All right. A third and last myth that I thought I would talk about is this idea that we often think that if we just take clients to lunch or a sporting event, or if we just set up a pitch meeting to introduce new lawyers or services to that client, that that's the best way to get them interested in our teaming and collaborative selling efforts. And the reality is that that tends to come off as awfully self-serving. So instead, what we want to do is help lawyers think about if they're going to approach teaming and collaborative selling, how do they do that in a way with the, where they're using authentic reasons to connect with clients and where they're tapping into triggers and that might transition a client into a buying mode that makes sense for them. Let me talk about a little bit about that. When a lawyer says to a client, hey, I'd love to introduce you to my client so-and-so, let's go to lunch with partner X. The problem with that, of course, is that comes to office self-serving, right? We look at a client and we say, gosh, we're doing all of their litigation work, but we'd love to do our, their employment work also. Let's take them to lunch with an employment partner and then tell them all about how that employment partner is great and why they should be doing business from, with them. But all of that has to do with us and what we're trying to accomplish it has nothing to do with what the client's trying to accomplish. And then this, and this is where uh, a tried and true concept in business development that we refer to as the platinum rule comes into play. So all of us know the golden rule, do unto others as you would be done into. If you went to Sunday school like I did or Lutheran school like I did, you know the golden rule well, right? And yet, in the context of business development, and in particular in the context of collaborative and team selling, we want our lawyers to apply a slightly higher standard, which is the platinum rule. In other words, do unto others as they would be done unto. So this is the idea that if we're trying to sell collaboratively in a team to a client, we've got to think about not what we care about, but what the client that cares about. And we can't presume that they care about the things that we care about because the reality is they don't, right? Our clients don't care about us having more revenue. They don't care about whether um, our lawyers are successful in their teaming and collaborative selling uh, capabilities. What they care about is what they're trying to accomplish, the problems that they're trying to solve, whether it's managing their budget, avoiding risk, expanding their organizations, growing their top line revenue. Those are the things that they care about. And so we have to help our lawyers put their themselves in those clients' shoes, see the world through their eyes, and then think about teaming and collaborative, collaborative selling from that perspective. So let's talk about a couple of concrete tools that our lawyers can use to do that. One is the three ins for authentic reasons to connect. So rather than randomly inviting people out to lunch or a sporting event or setting up a pitch meeting, we can tell our lawyers to think, look for an opportunity to use one of these three ins. And the three ins are number one, invitations. So can we invite a client or prospective client to a 
seminar or a webinar or another event that they would find value in attending where we might be able to connect them with other colleagues of ours within the firm, right? Invitations are one way to introduce our colleagues to those clients, but we've got to think about it from the perspective of is that invitation to a lunch, an event, a seminar, a CLE program, is that actually valuable to the client? A second one is the in of introductions. So this is our opportunity to say, what introductions do we have at the ready for this client or potential client that would be valuable to them? Is an introduction to that partner by saying, hey, you know, you all are dealing with this issue. This issue is affecting organizations like yours, and we have a colleague of ours who's advising clients on a regular basis on those issues. Would it be valuable for you to swap notes? On, the, on how you all are going about doing that. Maybe that introduction is valuable, but you got to think about it from the client's perspective. Or does an introduction to another client make sense, right? Say we're trying to introduce one of our partners uh, in a teaming and collaborative selling effort to a client. Does it make sense instead to make the introduction to one of that partner's clients, right? Hey, you, you all are dealing with this issue. We'd love to introduce you to another client of our firm who has navigated that path before and might be able to share their experience with you in a way that would be valuable to, do, to you. Again, applying that platform rule and thinking about from the perspective of what's going to be most valuable to the client or potential client. And then lastly is the in of insights. So this is our opportunity to say, hey client, we serve you in this area and we are so grateful for our work with you in that area. And we also know that you have issues affecting you in other areas where our firm has expertise. And it would be our pleasure if we can to offer some of our insights in those other areas because frankly, because you're a valued client of ours, we want you to have access to all of our best thinking not just our best thinking in the one area that we serve you in, right? This is going back to that generosity of spirit, solving problems that we don't necessarily get paid to solve, but doing it from a client-centric perspective. The other thing that we can do is, of course, the in of insights works both ways. So we might offer the client an insight or the potential client an insight. We also might seek an insight from them, right? So we might say to a litigation client, hey, we, we know we do work with you in litigation. We know a lot about your litigation matters and how you handle those matters. And yet, our colleagues in employment are working on some developments that are affecting your industry, and they're looking for insights from people in the industry on those issues. Would you be opening, open to lending your perspective and letting them pick your brain in a way that would be uh, valuable to them. And oftentimes our clients are really interested in sharing their wisdom and their perspective with us, even in areas that we're not serving them. And that can be a great way to introduce new relationships within our firm to them. The other tool that I want to offer you is the four C's. So when we think about creating those transitions or triggering events, the four C's are those opportunities for us to open the door to a client thinking about doing business with us in an area that they're not already doing the business with us. So the first C is the C of concerns. Um, when it comes to concerns, one of the things that we can be doing is helping our clients think about um, do they have capabilities that their existing uh, lawyers or law firms are not serving them in? Do they have a need for services or fees where uh, the client is not already uh, working with them in? Um, and is there a way that we can be uh, a benefit to those clients in those ways? So thinking about does the client actually have a concern about capabilities, service, or fees with respect to their existing counsel in a particular area that would give us an opportunity to introduce a resource from our firm. A second way that we, a second C that we can look to is the C of curiosity. So one of the ways that we can get clients thinking about working with our team is thinking about can we pique their curiosity about something new, innovative, or creative that those colleagues 
in uh, of ours in other areas are working on that they might be able to lend perspective on. And when we can pique that curiosity, that might give us the opportunity to say, hey, you know, our colleagues in employment are working on some really new approaches to solving an old problem. We'd love to share that perspective with you if you think it might be valuable to you. A third C is the C of confidence. So this is where we might work with our clients to think about what are the um, what are the things that they're working on where they might want a second set of eyes, a perspective, another perspective that would allow them to think about um, th things that they are doing in a different way. And so when we can do that, when we can help our clients think about um, do they really have all of their bases covered in the way that they want them to be? Or might we be able to give them a second set of eyes? Might we be able to give them a second opinion on their strategy on a case or take a look at a complaint from the, for them on our dime? Do a simple audit of their trademark portfolio, even if someone else is managing it, to give them a second opinion. Those are the kinds of things where we, when we can offer those things to our clients as a value add and an investment in our relationship with them, it can be a nice opportunity to introduce new colleagues um, from the firm and promote that teaming and collaboration. And then lastly is the C of connection. So remember that oftentimes our clients will uh, look to uh, be open to our teaming and collaborative selling efforts because they like us and because they trust us. And so sometimes we have to equip our lawyers to have the conversations with their clients and potential clients and say, look, I know that you know me and that you like me and that you trust me. I want you to I want you to take that trust and let me introduce you to someone in my organization that I think could bring something really valuable to the table for you. And because that client or potential client knows us and trusts us in a way that fosters that connection, we can look to that connection as an opportunity to introduce someone new. So at the end of the day, what we recommend is like with any other business development undertaking, that you organize these efforts into a formal pipeline or some kind of organizing mechanism. And what I've given you here is a simple team selling matrix where you might think about, number one, who are some of those clients that might be open to teaming and collaborative selling efforts between our lawyers? What are their objectives, interests, and concerns? And how does that match to our solutions, offerings, services, or expertise? And then how can we introduce those new lawyers or services or uh, expertise through either one of the three ins, invitations, introductions, or insights, or through one of the four Cs, a concern, piquing their curiosity, tapping into their sense of confidence, or looking to the connection that we have with them. All right, folks, I'm so glad that we were able to share this with you. It looks like um, we uh, don't have any questions at this very moment. However, if you find yourself thinking about these topics and looking for more resources, more of a sounding board, if there's ways that we can be a resource to you, um, I put my contact information here on this last slide. You should also know that everyone who was on the webinar today will receive a copy of the presentation along with the recording. And we invite you to the third in this series of webinars on July 26th, where we'll be talking about how lawyers can adapt to change and stay competitive in the innovation economy with our colleague, Deborah Baker. We hope that you can join us. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you have a rest, great rest of your day and week. Bye-bye.